In the 2010s, the dream of artificial intelligence that could rival and even surpass the human brain became real. The big tech companies, Google, Facebook, Meta, knew they'd have to harness this technology if they were going to win the new AI race. In fact, it was key to their very survival. But researchers within each company would soon sound the alarm that if the tech giants moved too fast, the consequences could be devastating. Hi, I'm David Brown, the host of Wondery's show Business Wars. We go deep into some of the biggest corporate rivalries of all time. And in our latest season, the tech behemoths fight to dominate the artificial intelligence space and reckon with the costs. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. As a freelancer, sometimes it can feel scary for the fact that if in a month your income is dramatically changing because you lose a client because of X, Y, and Z reason, it's scary to go look at those numbers and think, how am I going to pay for life? That's Frances, a 31-year-old personal trainer living in Toronto. She has been a freelancer for almost 10 years now. And in all that time, She's never been able to make a budget and stick to it. Ultimately, it comes down to the fear of knowing what my numbers are because my numbers have always felt scary because my income is always fluctuating. Last year, her highest paid month was April. She brought in $4,750. Her lowest month was October, 685 this is the unpredictability that has been holding her back from making a successful financial plan. Um, better being able to forecast when those upswings and downswings are helps it feel like it's easier to actually know, okay, this month I can save more if I want to because I know I'm going to have an influx or this month everything has to be exactly to the budget, otherwise we're gonna incur more debt or I'll have to tap into my savings in order to make sure that I can make this payment. This year, she's aiming to overcome those financial fears and tackle budgeting head on. I had a friend say very plainly, if you don't look at your finances, they'll have control over you instead of the opposite. It's like when you don't look at your health, that will run out of control until you actually look at it. And there's a lot of fear around that. There's a lot of discomfort around that. For me, this is like my fitness. <laughs> I have to keep going back to it um, and flex it and look at those spreadsheets. Otherwise, I mean, I'm just never gonna be able to lift that certain amount of weight or I'm never gonna be able to actually make that certain amount of money. It doesn't just come out of thin air. But this year, it's a little tricky because inflation means that the cost of goods and services, which you budget for, are totally unpredictable. So how do you build a budget when nothing in your financial world is predictable? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings, and you're listening to In This Economy. It's the show that helps you understand the systems that create our money problems, from grocery bills to mortgage renewals to budgeting, apartments, cars, and everything in between. Each episode, I talk to a person facing a financial challenge, like Francis, and then to an expert who knows the ins and outs of that problem and can explain the factors causing it and offer, if not perfect solutions, then options things that you can do, even in this economy. Despite the unpredictability of the market, a growing number of Canadians, whether by necessity or choice, are joining Francis in the freelance ranks. Statistics Canada reported that 2.9 million Canadians were self-employed in 2018, up from 1.2 million in 1976, and that number is likely way higher today. There's a lot of research that's saying that it could be, I mean, including people that have side gigs could be up to 28%, then others say one in 10. The research is, is kind of all over the place because a lot of people don't report their incomes. That is Joe Collins, the owner of Avalon Accounting. His firm specializes in accounting for small businesses 
which means, yes, freelancers. I think even from the data that that we do see, just a quick Google search will tell you that 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 number is really is increasing and and rapidly. Some say it almost doubled between 2022 and then this year here. And then obviously through the pandemic as well, a lot of people, hey, you thought I have some extra time on my hands and make some extra income. Do, do we know what's behind that? I mean, the pandemic is fine for finding side hustles, but in terms of like the people who are uh, living gig to gig or contract to contract without a regular employer and, and juggling clients. Yeah, I think it's probably a convergence of a lot of different factors. One is the barrier to entry for doing service type work online, getting paid, finding clients, that kind of thing is obviously much more accessible these days than it ever has been. Um, likewise, with other you know apps and things of of having you know Uber Eats or Uber itself, other avenues of sort of structured gig work is more accessible now than it's ever been. And then converging on the need for extra income, as we've seen prices of things rise, I think people are almost as a necessity looking for other ways to supplement their their normal income or, you know, giving up their full-time job to to focus on what seems to be maybe more money, more income immediately from a gig type work or freelancing type work. Are you seeing that reflected in uh, the people who come to you for accounting help? Is there an increased demand for support for freelancers or self-employed people? And what are they looking for? Yeah, I mean, we see a lot of people reaching out through our website and phoning in, that kind of thing, looking for more support on that. And I know I work out of a corking space and just... I mean, we definitely have a subset of of people and a certain demographic in there, but lots of questions coming from people that have, have recently started freelancing or, or gone out on their own. And generally what they're looking for is is just a demystifying. It's not something we learn in, in high school or in college about how to actually file your taxes, how taxes work, and putting all those things together so that you can actually file your taxes and, and meet all of your obligations and, and regulations and all of that. I think there's a lot of just not knowing what they don't know. That that tends to be the the kind of early statement I hear from from new freelancers. When someone gets into the business like that and they don't know what they don't know, what's the biggest mistake they can make through that ignorance? Well, I think you know, the context of of people moving to gig type work or going to freelancing is that they were employed. Maybe the work isn't what they wanted. They didn't like their boss. They're ready to move to a new job. And they look at freelancing as an option. They maybe have a few clients. They think, hey, the, I, I could do some work for this. And I think I could put my income together doing this. The first year is a really challenging one because even if you're being successful with finding those clients and getting paid on time and all of that good stuff, you you get these paychecks, <laughs> so to speak, from your client. They're, they're paying their invoices. And the biggest thing is that tax isn't taken off of that. And tax, I mean, if you really look closely at your pay stub, if you're employed, it is a big chunk of what you're getting paid. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a big realization in the first year for a lot of freelancers that, you know, they need to set a lot of money aside and not easy to do when the money's in your bank account to uh, not spend it. I think that's one of the biggest challenges new freelancers find for sure. This is the biggest question our listener has. And I mean, I think as somebody who who knows he couldn't deal with the hustle and the planning required to be self-employed. How the heck do you build a budget and track your finances when your income is not predictable paycheck to paycheck and month to month? How do you structure something like that? Yeah. And that is, I mean, it's a super challenging thing. You know, freelancing work can be up and down on the income side and not only income, because you can send out the invoices every month, but if you're clients aren't paying you, <laughs> then that cash isn't hitting your bank account. But, you know, your your credit card payments and things still still come out and rent and all of that. So you can't really match those cash flows. I think that's one of the most challenging things. 
Um, and then on the expense side, there's unexpected things that come up. You know, you can budget till the cows come home, but then, you know, I think we're over $6 for a loaf of bread here in Victoria. And, you know, you, how do you plan for 20, 30% extra on your groceries in a given year? And and budgeting itself, and, and we do this for businesses as well, is that budgeting is one aspect of it. You can look at your year and, and hopefully get a snapshot of where you might be in a year. But I like to think of it more as as forecasting. Um, and I know that's probably not a, a term that, that people are used to as far as, you know, managing your household income and expenses. But forecasting is budgeting, but it's just more adaptable. Like you update those things as you have new information. So if you know that next month you're you're going to have unexpected car repair or something like that, you can add that to your forecast. And the idea is that, you know, you don't have this set in stone budget that you're like, well, I got to throw that out because, uh, you know, three months into it, it's completely irrelevant. Um, you have something that's living, a living and breathing document that that changes as your circumstances change. And then the idea there is really, as you know, those changes are coming, you start to adapt. Hey, do I need to raise my hourly rate? If you're a freelancer, do I need to find some extra work, do a few more hours for a client, find other projects? Yeah. Or change your pricing. I think, you know, you can adapt to those changes with a forecast, whereas a budget, you kind of feel locked in and trapped. How do you go about, and uh, maybe just be practical here, like creating a forecast? I, I know how to do a budget because I write down various numbers and stick to it. How do you do a forecast? Yeah, so I think it's very similar to budgeting in that, you know, you you, you have 12 months generally that you're you're looking forward for, but you're just rolling that 12th month forward all the time. And, you know, next month is going to be much more clear to you than two months from now, than three months from now. And and as you get to 12 months, you know, you're, you're making a big guess at what that's going to look like. But as you continue to roll that forward and, and look at it each month, you, you build in the new realities of what the next month is going to look like and then add another month at the end to see where you're going to be in, in 12 months. I think really using a spreadsheet or something is key to this. I think you, you want to make it as simple as you possibly can at the beginning. People tend to get caught in a lot of detail of like, well, what are my pens going to cost next month? <laughs> or, right. you know, really the minutia of it. And really you were looking at broad strokes. So you, you're not going to be caught out with cash flow issues or, or something. You might have a miscellaneous expense in there to capture all those little things, but trying to keep it as few lines as you possibly can is key so that you're not just, oh gosh, I'm looking at this spreadsheet and it, did I put that in groceries last month? I, I mean, we have London Drugs here in Western Canada and I always think of it as the bric-a-brac store. You, you, you could buy groceries there, <laughs> you can buy automotive right. goods. <laughs> uh, it should have maybe Scented its own candles, expense category. whatever else they got. Yeah, exactly, yeah. In the 2010s, the dream of artificial intelligence that could rival and even surpass the human brain became real. The big tech companies, Google, Facebook, Meta, knew they'd have to harness this technology if they were going to win the new AI race. In fact, it was key to their very survival. But researchers within each company would soon sound the alarm that if the tech giants moved too fast, the consequences could be devastating. Hi, I'm David Brown, the host of Wondery's show Business Wars. We go deep into some of the biggest corporate rivalries of all time. And in our latest season, the tech behemoths fight to dominate the artificial intelligence space and reckon with the costs. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Let's put taxes aside because I want to dive into that in a moment because it is super important. Aside from taxes, when I look, and again, um, you know, as somebody in a, a full-time employed job, I look at my pay stub and I see a lot of things that are just being taken out of it for my benefit and because I've signed up for them. You know, there are benefits, there's unemployment, uh, there's an RRSP and that kind of stuff. How can a freelancer or somebody who's starting out uh, self-employed 
build that into their budget to account for it. And again, I know I'm, I'm not trying to be depressing and neither are you, but, you know, taking into account what we've just discussed. Yeah. And that's, that is, that's one of the big things I think, you know, going into freelancing work and, and that with your eyes wide open, if it's a choice, I mean, I know a lot of people don't have a choice, yeah. but understanding as well, what employment means, what the employer side takes on to take care of their employees. And that is the, the CPP piece. So a Canada pension plan, there's two sides of that. I think people don't understand is that, you know, you see that come off your paycheck, but, but your employer is actually matching that amount on their side as well and putting that money in. And when you're a freelancer, you got to pay both sides of that, which is, you know, nine, again, nine, nine plus 10 plus percent of your income. And then things like EI, which aren't mandatory for freelancers, you can opt into it if you like, but most people don't and understanding what exactly that is. It's a, it's a safety net if, if you do lose your job mm -hmm. and you need some time to find your next one. So help you pay the bills and things. So I think it's coming to terms with, with all of those things that, that are on that side and, and understanding maybe in your industry as well, is there employer type pension that uh, you're missing out on and make sure that you know, you build that into your hourly rate. All those things should be built into there. I know, again, there's there's sometimes difficulty. You want to offer, you know, get in with some clients with a low rate, but yeah. understand exactly all the things that you're giving up by freelancing and, and try not to give any of them up. I mean, you, you should have things like a pension. You should be able to contribute to CPP and pay your taxes and that. And you should at least be even with how you would be as an employee of a company, if not ahead, for taking on the extra risk of, of being on your own. It's an interesting point about wanting to keep your rates low, but also needing to find that money to, to make those contributions. And I imagine it would be easier to go in a little bit higher to make sure you have it than to realize later you have to raise your rates for those clients. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I think, again, like a quick internet research thing, you'll find arguments on both sides of this to, you know, get your client base, show them you can do a good job, build their trust. But I think, you know, depending on the, the kind of clients that you have and how conducive they are to, to those price increases and seeing your value, or if they're actually really looking for the lowest possible rate for the work that you do, you get a sense of people, I think, pretty quickly or, or clients really quickly of whether, whether they're on that side or the other. There's a good argument to be made for both sides if you start off high and, and make sure you never move your rates down or start low build your reputation and move up. It depends on individual circumstances, I think, and the kind of client base that you're looking at. But you definitely don't want to be trapped in into a, a low rate that really is undervaluing the work that you're doing and the value you're providing. As we talk here, um, at the start of the year, this is when a lot of self-employed people start to think about tax deadline coming in a couple of months, begin to get your documents together and try to budget for it. But Let's talk about it first more generally. You know, when you're making a budget at the beginning of a year, how much should you plan to put aside to cover taxes? Is there um, a reliable formula that you can apply that you can be reasonably sure will include everything you might owe? Yeah, I always kind of think of that as the, the th thirds rule. You put <laughs> a third aside to, to cover taxes. And that's more than enough for a lot of people. It does vary, of course. If you're in a really high income, you could be higher than that. Um, but putting a third of your your income aside into a, a saving account or something like that, then you, you should be covered for any taxes owing. Um, and I want to be clear, I'm not, I'm not talking about HST or GST here. I think that is not your money. So you shouldn't treat it as such. Mm -hmm. uh, you're collecting that on behalf of the government. So if you can put 100% of that into a savings account, that's ideal. But for income taxes, keeping a third aside is, is going to be enough for most people. And I, I know people love to get refunds on their tax return. And uh, it's, it's likely going to give you a refund as long as you don't have a super high income. Talk to me about how you should pay your taxes. I know this because uh, my wife is a freelancer. You don't have to pay them at the end of every year. You can pay them as you go. Uh, should you do it that way? Yeah. So again, there, this is going to be very um, 
person specific. Some, some there are requirements. So if you owe more than $3,000 in a year, uh, the government will tell you you need to pay quarterly installments based on your previous year's income. Um, and they'll give you that installment amount that you need to pay and the dates you need to pay it. Um, but if you're not required to pay installments and it's your choice, and in the first year, it's it's always your choice, then there's two sort of lines of thinking that I I tell some of our our clients. And, and one is that, you know, if, if you pay it, you can pay it monthly, you could pay it quarterly and, and the money's out of your account and you don't have to worry about it. You know, that can be good for a lot of people because the money's not just sitting there and begging to be spent. Um, and I know, you know, that takes a lot of self-control to, to put that savings amount into a savings account and not touch it because it's set aside for taxes. But if you're, of the type that can be very disciplined about that, putting it all in the tax account and rates are like interest rates have, have risen recently. I know uh, I got a well simple cash account and, and they pay 4% interest or something. If you can put some money into something like that, where you're actually earning some income, that's great. If you can be disciplined enough to, to leave it in there, you kind of have to know thyself <laughs> of whether you can have that discipline. I don't think there's a hard and fast answer to it. It really depends on on the person, but ideally, you'd put that into a savings account and earn some interest and and have a uh, you know a little bit extra for yourself. Let's talk about the completely unsexy aspect of this, which is meticulous bookkeeping. Um, maybe first with write offs, if you're willing to document everything, take that time, even though it might be frustrating, how much money can you take back? Yeah. So any any business-related expense is directly taken off of your income. So it's it's super valuable to to track all those expenses. And I mean, with modern tools, like it's not that difficult, really. Um but how many of the freelancers who come to you for help are really drilling down to that level to scrape back every cent they can? Yeah, that's a good question. I think some do a lot. Some push the envelope, to be honest, um, and that's okay. Uh, you can make an argument for lots of things being a business expense. And others, yeah, it's more a nonchalant attitude where, you know, it's like, oh, you know, if I save 30 cents on, you know, buying this box of pens, is that really worth my time to you know, document this thing? But I think, it, you know, it is worth it because those things do add up over the year. And the key is to make it as simple as you possibly can to set up, a, a, I think, a system that, you know, is kind of automatic when you go to the store and you have your receipt there. With with modern technology, it's 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 actually not a huge burden. I think one of the big things is to just set up a, a separate business bank account, mm -hmm. um, have a have a, a bank account that everything that goes through it is business related. Um, and the other is even have a separate credit card if you can. It it's, can be in your personal name. There's no issue with that. It doesn't have to be a, in a, a business's name, but put all your business expenses through a particular credit card. And it can be on the same points. It can be at all that stuff, but having a separate credit card there just keeps your data set really clean. You know, if you do miss taking a photo of receipt, you can still claim that expense. You, you may, it may be challenged by the CRA later. And if you can't produce a receipt, they may add that back, but it's not, no one's going to jail or anything. Like <laughs> it, it is a legitimate expense that you just lost a, a receipt for, which is is totally fine. I don't want people to take that the wrong way. You should still keep as many receipts as you possibly can. <laughs> uh, you don't want to come- You're walking close to the line here, yeah, are we, Yeah, well, you don't want to have CRA come and audit you and, and you have zero receipts. But if you have most of them and you missed one, you know, you might get a lenient auditor that says, okay, that, that sounds like a legitimate expense. And, and you, you obviously have a credit card transaction for it. No issue there. But uh, if you're missing all your receipts, that may be an issue. And then the other is for receipts, just taking photos of those and putting them into a, a Google Drive or something like that. Is, mm. it, it can be simple. It's all date stamped and the whole bit. You so. don't have to save uh, manila folders full of paper? No. And I'd advise you really don't because you know Google's got great backups. As soon as you take that photo and drop it in a folder, you know it's all time stamped and searchable and, and all of that. So you don't have to 
create this meticulous record keeping. Google kind of does that for you. Um, or you, if you want a specific receipt capturing app, there I'm sure you can find a multitude out there. But you know, just as simple as taking a photo and, and throwing it in a in a, a Google Drive folder, and you should be right as rain for that. Before we say goodbye, I want to ask you about the big picture of pushing yourself to do this work because you know how important it is. And, you know, when we spoke to Frances, she told us that, you know, she waited as long as she possibly could to even start budgeting and tracking just because of the kind of guilt and shame associated with not knowing where your money's going or how much is coming in. And I imagine it can seem incredibly daunting when you're doing this as a new freelancer starting from scratch. Absolutely. I would say that the the emotional and mental side of the budgeting and forecasting is probably the the biggest challenge. I think we when we we start anything, there's there's a lot of energy that that you have and motivation to you know do the right things. But you know if you have a bad month or you bought something you weren't supposed to or wasn't in your budget, you probably don't want to look at that and repeat yeah. that feeling over and over again. It's like any behavioral change, habit change, you kind of think of those things ahead of time and plan for them. You know, there are going to be moments where you make a mistake. There are going to be months where you didn't make the income that you were hoping to. Have a plan for that. Is is there a, a time that you you go in? What is it? Make it easy, make it obvious, and set a time for for that that stuff to happen and just show up for it and and build that habit. And it can take time. But we just start again. And if you've fallen off, then you start again. And and slowly but surely you build that habit and and know that there's there's things where you know you can see them coming and, and don't de- not deny that you're that you're gonna make some mistakes and try to be too perfect, but uh take that be be kind to yourself and, and just get back into it. I think that's the that's the key to it. Maybe one last question, because um this can seem, and I'm not uh, in any way trying to cast aspersions on uh, what you do, but it can seem uh, intimidating and like drudgery to somebody who is presumably freelancing because they want to do what they love as a career. Um, do you have any recommendations for how to make uh, taking control of your finances uh, and budgeting properly a little bit more approachable, fun, uh, accessible. I'm not sure exactly the word I'm looking for, but you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the funny thing about the whole, you know, budgeting, forecasting, tracking your, your income and expenses and bookkeeping and the whole bit is that whether you just have a side gig or this is your full-time, full-time freelancing job, it's the same amount of work almost because you have to, you know, do the same forms and GST and all that, all that stuff. Um, so, so number one is I think just just coming to terms with with that that this is, you know, it's not always easy. It's it's it is something new, and um, acknowledging that that that's a that's a part of it. It's something something new and different, and it's like learning any new skill. I think that the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Um, but as far as making it fun, I think setting some time aside is is one so that you don't have other distractions going on but you know whether it's a reward at the end of of doing that thing and that could be you know food related or experience related or mm-hmm. show related kind of thing uh maybe that's the time you listen to a particular podcast or something cuz it it's not heavy lifting mentally always right um you know a lot of it can be data entry but sinking into that, get some groove music going and, and just enter those into your spreadsheet and, and know that you're you're doing the right things. And that should help you feel better about adulting hard. <laughs> adulting hard or whatever you want to call it. It does suck. It's not easy. I'm not going to lie to you. But if you are a freelancer and you want to try budgeting or forecasting this year, here's what you need to do. First, and probably most obviously, you need to make a list of all your expenses, all of them. This includes day-to-day stuff, like rent and groceries and the business stuff, like the tools or the taxes. But it should also include things like health and retirement contributions. Once you have that total, 
you can work backwards from it to determine what you need to charge your clients to afford the things you deserve. You shouldn't have to deprive yourself just because you're your own boss. Second, taxes, lots of fun. When it comes to income taxes, start by setting aside a full third of your pay for collection. Then you can think, do I trust myself to leave that money alone for an entire year? If the answer is no, quarterly payments are probably your friend. If the answer is yes, though, you can try putting your tax money in a high-interest savings account so it can earn you a little cash before you have to hand it over. Last, I know I joked about taxes being fun, but not all of this has to be miserable. You can make your admin work fun. Set aside a specific time every week for doing it, for organizing those receipts and entering that data in the spreadsheet. And when that time comes, you can reward yourself by putting on some music or maybe your favorite uh, podcast while you work and treating yourself to takeout or something else you love when you're done. Doing this will, hopefully, motivate you to stop procrastinating and actually get into the numbers. Plus, it doesn't have to be manila folders and paper receipts stuffed into a drawer somewhere. You can utilize the power of searchable folders and make tracking easier by getting a separate account and credit card for your business. Doing those small things now will save you time and stress later. All right. Thank you so much to Joe Collins for sharing his expert knowledge with us. You can find more information about Avalon Accounting by visiting their website, avalonaccounting.ca. And of course, as always, thank you, Francis, for writing into the show with your money problem and opening up and talking about it, even though it's not easy. If you can be brave like Francis, we want to hear from you. You can email us at hello at itepod.ca. You can call us. Get on the phone, leave a voicemail, just talk it out. You can ramble as long as you want. We don't care. We listen to everyone. The phone number is 416-935-5935. And remember, we don't need your real name. We do need your real numbers. And you have to give us away if you're talking on a voicemail to get back in touch with you or else you're just screaming into the darkness. You can also find us on social media. We're on Instagram and TikTok. I'm something of a TikTok star at In This Economy Pod. Thank you so much for listening to this show. And if you liked it and if you want more of it, you got to share, you got to tell your friends, you got to rate and review. You got to show us some love or whatever your favorite podcast app lets you show us. I'm your host and executive producer, Jordan Heath Rawlings. This episode was written and produced by our showrunner, Stephanie Phillips. The sound design was done by Robin Edgar. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. And together, we make up the Frequency Podcast Network. We are delighted that you listened. Thanks for doing that. We'll talk next week on In This Economy. In the 2010s, the dream of artificial intelligence that could rival and even surpass the human brain became real. The big tech companies, Google, Facebook, Meta, knew they'd have to harness this technology if they were going to win the new AI race. In fact, it was key to their very survival. But researchers within each company would soon sound the alarm that if the tech giants moved too fast, the consequences could be devastating. Hi, I'm David Brown, the host of Wondery's show, Business Wars. We go deep into some of the biggest corporate rivalries of all time. And in our latest season, the tech behemoths spike to dominate the artificial intelligence space and reckon with the costs. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app.